if we have a singular AI that races ahead of us and just leaves us behind and just ignores us, um, then you may have something like that that we have to understand the world. But our world may not change very much. Maybe the AI will go off and do its own thing. So we may not comprehend it, but our world will then change that much. But let's assume that we do become superhuman intelligence as ourselves, either the AI uh, helps us to do that or the intelligence augmentation. Well, if that's the case, that even if, even if things are going faster and faster and changing ever more rapidly, surely as our intelligence expands, our ability to reason, to think in long chains of reasoning, to be creative, to come up with new ideas, to adapt, all of those things should also be growing. So subjectively, it seems pretty clear to me, we wouldn't really experience a huge, a huge change. It would be more of a gradual change, by the way, we through history. history. Even now, over the course of a year or ten years, we see a lot more change than people did in the past. Fifty years ago, hundred years ago, certainly five hundred years ago. And yet most of us you know, don't really experience too much future shock. It doesn't seem like things are changing that fast because we get used to it. So, you know, it's going to depend on how much uh, we change various faculties, how much we become more creative, improve our reasoning abilities versus being able to combat lots of new products, for instance. So, we could cope very well, we could not really notice the difference, or we may have some strain. But probably we do have some strain now. Uh, for instance, I haven't bought a new cell phone in several years, because I kind of think about, well, first of all, I don't really need one of the fancy super phones, but also because it's kind of a bit daunting, all those different choices, uh, different operating systems and different apps. Um, so, in that sense, I do have a little bit of future shock with cell phones, they're just a little bit too complicated. I don't really need all that uh, functionality. But overall, I don't think we're going to subjectively experience that kind of shock. It's only going to look like a singularity if we take a historical point of view. Clearly, if you went back to uh, the hunting gatherer days and uh, found some proto human in the cave and explained to them what the 21st century was like, that would be future shock. They would be completely baffled. They would understand things. It would take a long time to establish the concept for them to understand that. So they would be shocked. But that's not the situation we're talking about. We're talking about us being part of this wave of change. So subjectively, I don't really see uh, that being something that looks like or feels like a singularity. But more interesting is the objective singularity. Will objective measures approach a singularity? That is, the singularity in the sense, which I'm primarily referring to here, of a discontinuity, an intelligence explosion. I'm not going to get worried so much about the prediction horizon of you. That's so fundamental. Well, that depends on what's going to happen. Will things keep accelerating exponentially, or will that perhaps flatten out? Uh, or will it flatten out temporarily and then take off again? Because the, the few usually get, especially in the Willis Grouse, again from Ray, Ray Kurzweil's book, uh, he's really he sketched this out in the most detail, those curves look awfully smooth. And he finds some arguments as to why we should expect it to be smooth. Uh, but it is pretty smooth, it's not up and down, back and forth, really. But there could be factors that slow things down. David Chalmers wrote a paper not um, long ago on singularity, in which he talked about defeaters. Philosophers looked at it in terms like this. Defeaters are the conditions that can stop or slow down or even reverse something towards the singularity. And he classified those as disasters. Pretty some huge disaster that can slow things down. If this volcano had kept going for the next five years without stopping, and if another one had popped up in the southern hemisphere, well, that could be pretty disruptive. It would have slowed down travel a lot. Disrupted trade, could have knocked out our economies, uh, even worse than they already have been, and that could have slowed things down for a long period of time. And because there are worse disasters than that, uh, so I believe we'll hear about this up then. Apart from disasters, there's this disinclination. Perhaps we say, the heck with all this progress, we've had enough. And to us, that may seem incomprehensible, but there are actually quite a few people who seem to have that attitude. Uh, it's exemplified by the writer Bill McKibben, which he puts very directly in the title of his book, Enough! So it could be any more direct than that. I think, you know, more people uh, who stress and strain all the choices they have to make may be disinclined to uh, adopt innovations. And then, of course, there's active prevention. If we, as a society, decide that new technologies are too, too risky, uh, not just make us uncomfortable, but they're too risky, we may actually legislate against them. Now, whether that will stop them permanently is another matter. Uh, a lot of people believe that eventually someone in some country is going to pursue them anyway, we can't really stop it. But uh, it can slow it down for a long time, it can reverse things for a while. So what I worry about with the idea of a singularity, I mentioned, David mentioned this idea, he specifically repudiated the notion of automatic progress. But I think, um, and most singularities do have a fairly sophisticated view of that, they do deny that there will be automatic progress, that there are real factors.
is pushing us inevitably in that direction. But I do worry that some notions of singularitarianism look rather like the ideas of Marxist progress, uh, the inevitability of human uh, progress, uh, and a Hegelian basis rather than a technological basis. Uh, but I think there's, there's sort of the same kind of underlying Platonism, I think actually the roots of uh, it's called Hobart, uh, the roots of Marxism actually in Plato in a way, uh, abstracting from a lot of real factors. And I think there's, there's sort of a technological Platonism, if you like, in at least some versions of singularitarian thinking. Uh, it seems to be based on a very pure mathematical extrapolation. It's lovely, smooth, rising curves are very appealing to uh, technical minds. And I think most of the discussions seem to miss a lot of the factors that I've talked a bit about, uh, which may slow down the singularity or you know, we don't really experience anything like that. First of all, extrapolation is kind of a risky forecasting method in the first place. It really only works under certain conditions. Ironically, given that the singularity is a kind of discontinuity, one of the factors that destroys extrapolation as a forecasting method is discontinuities. Uh, extrapolations are based on certain driving forces being present, and if they go away, then uh, the extrapolation no longer applies. Uh, also, it's pretty clear that most actual technologies, certainly individual technologies, if you look at them, have never adopted uh, the improvement of technology and their adoption, tend to follow an S curve. They don't just go on up like this, they tend to go up for a while. And if you look at a certain part of the curve, you think, oh, that looks like a like singularity curve. But they usually top out and start to go down. So a lot Now, Ray Curzon has explicitly addressed that, and he argues that, for instance, very, pretty plausibly in the case so far of microprocessor technology, that you jump from one S curve to another S curve to another S curve, and you keep going up. And because there are open questions about whether we can keep doing that with computer technology, how far that will go. Uh, I'd like to take an optimistic view that there are no real limits in the next few decades. But there are many experts who disagree on that, and we are going to get some hard limits. Uh, or at least there are unproven technologies for going to higher experts. Can we actually make quantum computers work? Or some other uh, form of computing that's going to hit uh, limits, you know, facing the typography, for instance, right now. So I don't think there's any inevitability that we're going to jump to another S curve. And I think projecting that line, that curve, smoothly too far into the future is making that assumption. And that's something which is, is an assumption, it's not yet proven. There's also the worry that we become a more and more complex society, and complex systems under certain conditions can suddenly collapse. And that can awfully, you know, an awful kick in that curve. <coughs> People like Jared Diamond have talked about that, that the societies can collapse. Um, okay, I highly recommend the Black Swan discusses complexity disasters. Uh, so, again, we could have one of those. We've actually seen plenty of examples, which worry us recently, the financial system and the economic system, um, where we've had complex ways of dealing with finances uh, and economies that we didn't completely understand, uh, understand very well at all. We've used mathematical models for risk management, uh, for measuring the risk of mortgages, mortgages and so on. But people really had no clue about that, using models because other people were using them, and everybody was using them, so they must be right, but they were not right. And in fact, going back to the Black Swan, Taleb argues that a lot of these are based on Gaussian distributions, which he has a lot of very harsh things to say about. He was a little over the top, but pretty handy things. But uh, in power laws or other uh, descriptions of other ways of looking at risk, uh, I mean, we want our current models don't work well. So it could be that we're in a complex system that could suddenly collapse, and much worse than we've already seen. It already has collapsed in various ways. Uh, so we're pulling out of it, but it could be something worse ahead. I also worry about even in the most detailed analysis of the singularity, which I think has to go to Ray Kurzweil, and there's a huge book on that, with lots and lots of data points, lots of different graphs, lots of different technologies. Even the, I know some people have challenged some of this data, arguing, for instance, especially when it goes back into the deep past, and argues that uh, the law of accelerating returns applies, you know, essentially billions of years back. Uh, some evolutionary biologists have criticized that, saying it's pick points, uh, basically to fit the graph. Uh, I'm not going to go into that in detail, but I'm going to go through a lot of his charts and you know, looking at all the data points and saying, is this the only one that can be used to be picked as to, to suit the curve? But there is some concern about which data points you pick and whether it really shows uh, it's a fairly smooth acceleration change. So you can look at some historical examples and say, well, you know, there have been advances in the past which, uh, in the 20th century, which have very, been very slow to actually lead to any kind of new understanding, new applications. Um, it's like quantum theory, which has been around for a long time now, uh, almost a century really, um, 